The views and opinions expressed in the following podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the producers, the affiliates, or digital platforms hosting this podcast. All content is for the purposes of education, conjecture, and at times entertainment. We promote inclusiveness and diversity. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Into the Deep with Jay Casta. Welcome to Into the Deep. I'm Jay Costa. I am ecstatic about today's guest. He's a self-taught artist, originally from Portland, Oregon. His work's been described as a mashup of folk art meets medieval painting and fairy tale illustrations. Today's guest is Mark Rogers. Mark creates narrative-driven paintings populated by fictional characters that inhabit his self-described spooky, fantastical, and sometimes humorous oil paintings. His work's been shown in exhibitions all across the United States and has been sold worldwide. We talk about so much in this episode. We talk about his inspiration and his influence, everything from Stephen King and H.P. Lovecraft to punk and metal. We talk about the collective consciousness and the subconscious and how it plays a role in his creativity. So if you like the spooky, the paranormal, the supernatural, UFOs and extraterrestrials, and chaos magic, join me as we seek light and journey into the deep with Mark Rogers. Enjoy. Mark, thank you so much for joining me. I can't thank you enough for your time. Oh, thank you so much, Jay. Thanks for having me on your show. This is cool. Oh, absolutely. Well, I know who you are, but if you don't mind sharing with our listeners and our viewers who you are and what it is you do. Um, my name is Mark Rogers. I'm a painter. Um, I'm originally from Portland, Oregon, and now I uh, recently just moved to Fort Wayne, Indiana. And... Um, I paint um, paintings that are uh, narrative and story based, usually about um, paranormal things. They're kind of spooky and kind of funny. And that's, I guess, how I would describe what I do. Yeah. Yeah. I've been painting since uh, 2009. Um, yeah. I love it. It's my favorite thing. Oh. That's great. And, and I'm glad because I, I felt the same way, but it's, it's, you know, one's interpretation of another's art and expression is always so different, but I'm, I'm glad I was at least within that wheel, uh, the wheelhouse of like really enjoying the, the fantastical nature and the narrative based. And then also at times, I think hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I like making people laugh. I try not to take myself too seriously. So, so yeah, they're pretty fun. That's awesome. And you said you've been painting since 2009. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. I was about 30 when I first started painting, but I had been doing art when I was younger, but I didn't really realize that art was going to be my career path um, until later in life. I played in punk bands before I tried to become a horror author for maybe five years. I wrote, um, horror stories i really wanted to do something kind of stephen king-ish um hp lovecraft um yeah and i just kind of dabbled and stuff i graduated from the u of o in 98 with a political science degree of all things and i don't really enjoy talking about politics or, <laughs> or anything related to politics i think um i just got that degree because it was uh, sort of easy um <laughs> it was easy at the time. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I started, um, I bartended for a while after college and then during my days I would have a wide open space and I just started dabbling in a few different things like writing and stuff. And then eventually I started painting and, um, <clears throat> well, I went back to the Actually, I'm trying to think about how this kind of happened. I guess I went back to school and I had been um, like kind of drawing my whole life, I, but I hadn't really thought about that as a career. But I 
went back to school and I thought maybe I would do like graphic design because I really enjoyed um, playing in bands. But one of my favorite things about playing in bands was making the posters. So, um, so yeah, I went back to school to do some graphic design and I took a painting class um, as one of my electives. And then I uh, lasted like two weeks in this painting class um, this was, this was after I graduated. This was like when I was 30. Yeah. And I, t- I lasted two weeks in the class and I was like, okay, I think I found my thing. I don't know how to do it yet, but I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. It was weird. It was like an out of, or it was like, um, something that I'd done in my past life when I painted, I was like, this feels really weird and trippy, but, um, I'm going to drop out of school and spend every day painting. And then I'm going to try to become a professional painter one day. My ex-wife loved it. She loved that plan. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. No kidding. I I love that you mentioned that there was something that inherently felt right about it, almost like predestined, so to speak. Yeah, it was very bizarre having that feeling. I was um, in the class. We were doing a still life of something and who knows what it was. But um, but yeah, I definitely felt felt this feeling as if I had done it before or if um, it was somehow already inside of me or like I had some sort of ancestor who had painted before but maybe it was to my DNA or something. I can't really explain it beyond that. It was a really trippy kind of magical feeling though, when I first did it, um, <clears throat> it took a little, it took a few years before I started painting like the things that I paint now. But, um, but yeah, I definitely felt like putting, putting paint on a brush and moving it around. It felt pretty natural. Right on you had mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, possibly you, you thought, you know, maybe I'll be a writer. I'll take a stab at this. And you mentioned like Lovecraftian and King inspired type stuff. Uh, did you ever publish anything or blog anything? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I uh, got five short stories published in five years and I made $5. Five is my lucky number though. So that's right okay. But I mean, I guess I can kind of, um, as far as writing goes, I mean, I kind of get all that I needed. Now um, I can write these stories and uh, I'm mildly dyslexic. So maybe painting is better, that, uh, better for me because I don't have to um, punish people with all of my um, typos and grammatical mistakes and stuff. And painting seems like it works pretty good. It's interesting especially, you know, for those visually minded, you know, and able to express oneself, like you said, you know, maybe, maybe that is it. I don't know. Like you're trying to get out these feelings, these ideas, and these fantastical thoughts and to be able to put them in form. It seems like that's what's, it resonates with you and it clicks. Yeah. Yeah. And painting is a little bit different than writing just a linear story. It's got more of a, or, or the way that I approach it, I guess it has more of like a dreamlike quality, like where sometimes your dreams might not make 100% perfect linear sense. Like if you're watching like a series uh, like on Netflix or something and you point out little plot holes and things like that, or just different things like that. I don't really have to worry about that when I'm, um, when I'm painting a series. I usually work in a collection of nine. Um, I'll write a story and then I'll chop that up into nine different paintings. And so I work in a series of nine, like a lot of artists work in series. So Mm. I, I um, will take, uh, take the story and make a beginning, middle and an end. So three paintings in the beginning, three paintings in the middle, three paintings in the end. And they're all different paintings with different characters, but they're all set in the same uh, fantasy world that I call the Southwestern Bellows, which is a little bit inspired by um, Palm Springs, where my dad lives, and a little bit of Portland. And I think I need to um, 
to incorporate some Indiana stuff now that I'm over here. So I might expand my, I have like a little map, like a fantasy, like that you would have if you're um, reading a fantasy novel and stuff. So I might need to expand my map or maybe if you're playing D and D or something like that. So I really want to play D and D someday. I feel like that would be one of those things where if I was to play D and I would be like, Holy shit. I played D and in a past life. <laughs> this feels right. But I've never done it yet. And I'm like 43. So I don't know when that's ever going to (laughs) happen. I'm also 43. Um, Oh, cool. Yeah. And I grew up playing D&D and AD&D, you know, before like, you know, being in a metal band. So it was like the thing you did. And Oh, you're um, in a metal band. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And uh, it's so funny that you mentioned D&D because I I look at your artwork and I think like, wow, these would be great in like manuals and like books and like, Oh my gosh. It's so funny that it just resonates in the exact same way that I was just vibing on that. <laughs> oh yeah. What was your, what was your band? So uh, we're still a, a band. We just don't tour as often. Uh, the name of the band is thy will be done. And it's secular. It was just, uh, you know, just a whole, like it's thrashy, it's heavy, it's groovy. Um, we've done all kinds of tours uh, throughout the United States, North America, actually, because we did Canada as well. Uh, Europe, Japan, a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, cool. That's yeah. great. What do you play? I sing in the band. Oh, that's great. I'll have to check that out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's uh, it's fun because music and that expression, right? Like that's, and this is, I kind of, it's what I notice with your artwork and, you know, hearing the backstory of like, you know, that writing and that narrative element, you know, because there's so much more to your paintings in my, in my opinion and, and viewing it it does resonate with a story. Like, I mean, I can see something and think, I mean, Yale Nibley is such a great name. And <laughs> just, I love that painting. Of, it's just, it's so great. And I mean, I don't know who doesn't want to be Duke of the solar system. I mean, that's just, it's so fantastical. And like, like where, where are you pulling this inspiration from? I pull it from, um, from, uh, a lot of different places a lot of well that painting specifically came from some of my spiritual practices um like not in a silly way like in a real way that Mm. i that i do it um that was kind of just about um just meditating and then i you know then i started feeding other stuff into that idea and then i came up with a little story about it but um but yeah, like every, anything from like my spiritual practices to um, UFO documentaries, anything paranormal that's like maybe slightly based in the real world, like, um, and then I can, you know, take all of these things and turn them into something different. But um, but yeah, I do weirdly like to put. Um, some of my spiritual practice is into it. It's almost like painting and making up these weird stories and stuff is part of my religion. Um, I want to, the next series I do, I'm actually creating, um, I'm using some characters that I, there are my actual and well, actually there's one in this series that I'm working on right now. This is literally one of my spirit guides that I invented and I made up and I talked to him in meditation And I'm actually, I've painted him like nine times now. And I'm like, talk with him almost every day. It's very, it's very trippy to like have that sort of a relationship with these imaginary characters. I don't really hang out with a lot of people. I'm pretty busy, but I have a lot of imaginary friends. So I'm pretty popular in my imagination. Right on. (laughs) And and that's so incredible that, you know, again, you've got these stories that you create and it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong here, it sounds like you you make these stories and then the paintings come to life? Um, yeah. Um, the way I've been doing it lately is I um, have been uh, pulling a tarot spread. So, I'll, um, so I, we'll make up the story using the tarot. Um, mm-hmm. And then I'll kind of design the characters a little bit using the tarot as well. So I have like a very specific story spread that I do every time. Um, I don't know if you're, if you do tarot at all, but, um, 
but yeah, I'll do, I'll do like a spread with um, like five cards. I'll say that one um, one slot will be the main character. One will be its conflict. One will be the uh, setting, the emotion for the story, um, uh, like a sort of a theme. And those will be like my five slots. So we'll start going with that, and then maybe I'll pull more cards to to maybe design a little bit more, but. Um, but yeah, I kind of like that way of coming up with a story because you never totally know what you're going to get. And then um, and then your brain makes all these bizarre magical connections and something that you never thought would t- come out of it would happen. Like um, the, the series I'm doing after this one, the one I'm working on right now is called The Grand Recital and it's actually about music. It's I started practicing um, I started a classical guitar practice a little while ago, um, maybe maybe closer to two years ago. Um, but I wanted to incorporate that into my series. So it's about this um, girl who gets abducted by these aliens, and her brother goes out looking for her and um, to get her back. And he like, I don't know. It's a pretty convoluted story, but in the end the aliens were just giving her guitar lessons. So she comes back and she's like this amazing classical guitar player. There's this battle. There are reptilians. They totally die because her playing is so, so rad. And then, um, and then the next series I'm working on, I have it all plotted out and drawn out in my sketchbook. It's about, um, it's going to be a, a love story about Bigfoot, about, um, how he wants to find true love. So he, um, and I pulled that tarot spread on Valentine's Day um, last year. So, um, and I had the lover's card appear in that spread too. So those were some of the reasons why I was like, oh, weird. I never really thought I would do a Bigfoot love story, but the tarot wants me to do that. So I guess I'm going to do that. Um, <clears throat> so, so yeah, it's about a, it's about a Sasquatch named Apple Bear Stone Tree who, um, who transforms himself into a human to find true love and he finds love he meets a sasquatch hunter um who's hunting for a sasquatch and he joins the hunting party and it turns out in the end she is also a sasquatch in human form posing as a sasquatch hunter to find true love and they find each other and then they open a weird psychedelic portal to like a primordial like dinosaur world and then they they go there to like i don't know have weird offspring or something (laughs) so so that's the next series i'm going to be painting after this one and then after that i already i i work way far in advance from like my paintings I'm going to do one about the Palladians or a version of the Palladians. There's going to be a lot of blue jumpsuits. Right on. Whoa. I love it. I, I, I just hearing the workflow too. And like how far in advance you're thinking, you know, is there, is there a reason for that? Is just, that's part of, you know, how it works for you. Yeah. I have everything. I'm like very methodical and like kind of planned out. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but Here's my storyboard. So I've got my nine little, uh, nine paintings, um, kind of drawn out. I draw, oops, I draw out everything in my sketchbook. So every day I'll kind of be working on a future thing in my sketchbook. And then, um, and then I'll batch out like, um, three paintings. Like I'll do the preliminary drawing for three paintings and then, I don't know. I guess I have kind of a painting workshop. I suppose I have everything. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, I'm not one of those scattered artists who mm. has like a lot of wild drama and um, I'm just like flying by the seat of my pants, right. and just somehow able to keep it together. I'm very, very methodical and um, almost like a computer programmer or something like how they would do it even though I paint totally weird stuff, like my process is very type A or something. Mm. Yeah. It seems almost ritualistic in a sense. Oh yeah, it definitely is. Yeah. Yeah. Even my day-to-day routine is very, um, 
is totally a ritual. Right on. You know, is there, there ever been some influence or, you know, um, you you mentioned tarot, you know, any of the esoteric or occult uh, type influence that maybe you, you partake in or maybe influence what you're doing? Yeah, I'm a Wiccan. So that's kind of my spiritual practice there. Um, I got into that. Well, I mean, I don't know. I guess I've always been into the occult sort of stuff. I was raised Catholic and um, that just didn't quite work for me. But maybe that was also uh, one of my biggest art influences because I was, um, you know, in Catholic church as a kid. And I remember kind of just like spacing out and like checking out this nativity scene, which, which is a series, which is a story, but it's like a series. So it's actually like the same way that I kind of work. So it's like, um, but, um, but yeah, as far as like occult stuff, um, yeah, I practice Wicca, I meditate, I do yoga. I, um, I like chaos magic a lot. I like the idea of chaos magic. Um, I started reading about ceremonial magic back in college when I was, you know, my early twenties, I started reading about chaos magic back then and in Wicca back then. Um, yeah, I, I, I like being an armchair, um, sort of practitioner too. I love reading about all that stuff. I don't have time to practice it all. So, I have a very stripped down like practice where I celebrate the Sabbaths and the different wheel, the wheel of the year. And I, um, you know, I meditate every day and talk to my weird characters. So incorporating some elements of chaos magic, like where you also create your own gods and you do stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> so I definitely into um, using my imagination to make things happen in the real world. I love that oh, so much. And it's, it's evident just with, you know, some of the, whether it's the symbolism or maybe even the choice of color and the composition, at least to my eye, there's, there's so much in there. And you bring up like some of the, you know, like some of those, you know, like paintings commissioned by the Catholic church, you know, like where like, you know, whether it was like Michelangelo or any, like we're, sometimes there was more to that painting. Maybe they were throwing a little extra something in there for those with the eyes to see. Maybe, you know, those who would have a nod of the esotericism to know what it would be. And I almost kind of sometimes get that in impression with some of the things that I, I view in your work. Yeah, I definitely have to put that part of myself in it because I mean, when you're spending like five or six hours almost every day, just painting, I mean, I don't know. That does feel like a religious practice mm. in a lot of ways. Um, so, <clears throat> so yeah, I even will go as far as to put sigils in paintings. Um, I've done stuff where my paintings have been actual spells, like where I'll write words underneath the paint in the underpainting part and then i'll paint on top of them and the only person who knows about it is me um just different different things like that um i created this um alien language or series of runes called parodia which means parody in spanish so it's also kind of like a joke too um but it's also a cactus as well so in my weird myth alien mythos one they have two religions or the gray aliens at least i have a variety of different aliens in my stories but the gray aliens practice two religions one of them is their um <clears throat> they have a religion that's a death religion and then they have a religion that's related that's uh, all about cactuses and um so parodia is their cactus religion uh, set of runes. So I have these runes and each one of them means something different. So I, if I'm feeling something um, and I want to make my painting be like, a, have an extra weird internal meaning to me, I can put one of these runes in the painting like in place of text, like if I have a storefront, I'm going to paint, I can put like a rune and 
like an alien language there. And it means something specific to me, but I also let people know what they mean because I will post my, like the key to all of my um, stuff online. So if somebody wants to get, get real weird with it, they can look up what um, I make this stuff available so people can figure out what the, what it actually means. So I love that. And I, it's one of the many reasons why I thoroughly, sincerely enjoy your work is because there's so many layers to it. It's it, there's so much, even the backstory and just, you know, hearing this now, like there's so much to it and I, it's, it's prolific, honestly, it's, it's fantastic work. And uh, do you see yourself maybe doing, you know, you know, the proverbial coffee table book or like maybe something when you mentioned like your key, something like that? Yeah, what I would really like to do is, um, it's like a coffee table book, but it's um, it's like a hybrid art book, um, story book. So it would be, I want to have five series of these nine paintings in them. So, so it would have 45 paintings total um, with text. So it would, um, so you could read it like a book, but then it's also an art book as well. Cause it would have like, um, the map and keys in there and just different things about the process. So it wouldn't be, yeah, it would be a hybrid of the both. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be just, um, a storybook and then it might have a few standalone paintings sometimes i do that too where i won't work in a full series like that yale nimbly character the painting that you brought up that one's just a standalone painting with a story so maybe i would have something like that but i would love to make a book um yeah i'd love to to do that it's kind of in my it's in my plans for the future um not sure when that'll take place, but uh, I'd love to. It's it's so fascinating how you know we can start on a trajectory, or at least you know what you know goals are. Whether it's you know you know being in punk bands, being wanting to be a writer, going to school for political science, and then you know you find yourself you know now painting, and yet you know there's still that something in you about you know books and storyline and everything. It's just it's it's amazing how life takes these takes us down these different paths. I had this, um, this one, I had written a couple of novels, um, none of which were very good, but one of the, uh, one of the characters in one of the books, um, before I even started painting, um, was a painter and this character, she painted like monsters and stuff like that. So, and it was many years after I had been painting that I realized that I had done that that I had written a story like a full novel where one of the characters was a painter who painted all these spooky things. And I was like, it's like weird. Did I do that to myself by writing that story? (laughs) I don't know. I mean, that's like, when you think about like chaos magic type stuff where you're programming your subconscious, right? You're like, Whoa, did I just do that? Because I, or maybe it was already in there, or maybe, I don't know, the aliens were beaming that into my brain. I don't know. A lot of people will just automatically assume that I'm like, have had a lot of alien experiences because I do paint a lot of aliens, but I've only seen a UFO. I've never actually met with any aliens. Right on. If you don't mind me asking, how long ago did you see one? Um, I saw a UFO in 2009. I was um, just walking to the convenience store and um, it was in Springfield, Oregon. And it happened pretty quick. It was like a fireball sort of energy ball type of um, UFO. Uh, I don't even know if it was a craft or what it was, you know, it could have been ball lightning. Oh no, I've heard that's a thing, but I don't know. I've never seen anything like it again. It was orange it flew over the house tops. Like I was walking down the sidewalk and it flew over the house tops pretty slowly. I would say it maybe like 25 or 30 miles an hour. I just sort of watched it cruise by, you know, it was very low to the ground just over I'm sort of looking out the window right now. 
badging it and it was sort of above the telephone lines and uh i saw it with my ex-wife we both watched it and it flew by and it was sort of anticlimactic like it happened and then we were like yes okay now what that was it and then um i got a telescope tried to check it out all summer long hoping to see something cool saw nothing (laughs) so but yeah, I guess I saw something weird once. Um, I saw ghosts and stuff like that when I was a kid, but nothing, um, nothing alien-ish, you know, other than that. Right on. Now, you Have you ever seen an alien or anything like that? I haven't yet. I'm hoping. Uh, I, I thought I did several months ago. It was just the Starlink, uh, the, uh, the Starlink satellites there. I happened to be oh. outside looked up and saw the string of lights immediately, you know, hop on the phone, start looking up, like if anyone else is seeing it. And then lo and behold, it was the, uh, the Starlink satellites, but man, it felt so good for a, a split second. Cause I had been hoping <laughs> for so long. I was like, yes. <laughs> when you, when you saw this in 2009, I, I, my mind immediately goes to, was this before you had this epiphany in 2009 about starting a whole different path? Um, gosh, I've, I remember talking to somebody else about this. Yeah. And it was kind of interesting that they both happened in that same year. Um, but yeah, I did have the epiphany to do that in 2009, but I don't know. I can't quite remember if it was before or after seeing the UFO, um, Gosh, I think I I actually saw the UFO before I became a painter. Now that I think about it, um, yeah, I think I saw it before, but um, I don't really know if it would be related. That would be very bizarre if it was related, though. But when I first started painting, I didn't necessarily jump into the alien stuff. I didn't paint um, that type of material until maybe three or four years later, I wanted to, but there was a part of me that felt like people were going to think it was really cheesy and weird, which it is. And now I just do it anyway. But, um, but yeah, it is kind of bizarre that it happened around the same time. Hmm. And you mentioned, I've always been interested in aliens though. And, you know, all paranormal things ever since I was a little child. Um, you We're t- the same age, X Files. Yeah, oh, so, right. Oh yeah. my gosh, X Files <laughs> all day long. You uh, you said you saw some ghosts when you were a kid, or um, had some paranormal activities when you were a child. Yeah, yeah. I've had a few out of body experiences, and I've seen some ghosts. Um, one of my uh, ghost experiences was um, I was in high school, and I was driving my parents' minivan home from high school um it was sort of in the winter time so it got dark quite early or maybe it was around sort of like a duskish time so um especially in oregon it gets it gets really dark like at four o'clock in like november it's pretty dark so i was driving home across this bridge um that goes over a creek and i looked to my left and there or sorry, I looked to my right and there was a woman, like the very stereotypical woman in white style ghost, um, just standing um, to, to the right of the bridge. And what was weird about it was there was a drop down that was really, there was where the creek was, but this um, white woman figure was... Um, she was on the same level as the car. So she was floating above the ground, like 10 feet in the air. And I saw that and I, as I was driving by and I, I don't know, I didn't really have any um, further experience with that one. And uh, it was just a bizarre thing, but I've heard other stories of this, of that style of ghost. I don't know if you've heard them, but they're often called the woman in white. I feel like the whole, the whole person um, was sort of glowing like a, like as a, 
like a lightish color, you know? Mm. Um, I don't know if their clothes were white or if like their whole, whole being was like one monochromatic light color. Um, <clears throat> then the other one I saw um, was a, the conquistador standing over my bed when I was a kid. And that's just totally random. Um, uh, and I've felt like different things like that um, and maybe not seen them, you know, seen a full bodied apparition, but um, there is here in Fort Wayne, there's um, this place called the bell house or the bell manor. I'm still learning about this city, but they have a uh, ghost tours. And I think that would be pretty fun to do. Yeah. I did a ghost tour in Portland and um, it was of the Shanghai tunnels um, underneath Portland. There's said to be ghosts and activities like that. And um, they were, uh, we all had our EMF detectors out and we we're walking around checking things out. And um, we all hushed and we're super quiet. And um, our, our leader um group leader was like okay if there's anybody here can you give us a sign of sign of your presence and we all just started hearing like this screaming and it was just like somebody who was probably on crack like on the street above like <laughs> screaming you know like there's so many like gnarly people in chinatown in portland um there's just always screaming and like terror so um <laughs> so yeah that was kind of fun <laughs> didn't see a ghost on that trip though but <laughs> uh, i hope to go ghost hunting again yeah i, just, I love the impeccable timing of the scream <laughs> it was perfectly timed <laughs> it was chilling That's awesome do do you i do you i guess do research or like do you are there like topics uh, you know that sometimes fascinate you where like you know you'll kind of maybe do a deep dive or just kind of skim an article and then like feel inspired and then all of a sudden you know some new ideas for art come out of it um let's see i'm pretty inspired by celtic mythology mm -hmm. um i took a celtic mythology class in high school or in college sorry and i'm still researching about that to this day i find it pretty fascinating i like those old stories because i love fantasy stuff mm -hmm. um in addition to like sci-fi and i feel like that's celtic mythology in a lot of ways feels like the roots of all of the modern fantasy that we that we're familiar with today um so sometimes i'm inspired by that like fairy tales and folklore and stuff in that realm um but yeah, other things that inspire me are very unpredictable when I'm when I hear about them. I mean, it can be anything from science to um, just like a new routine or health thing or something I want to make a little bit of fun of or it's really unpredictable. Um, I mean, like I read books about like the occult magic and stuff, but I don't necessarily weave all of that into my stories. I might even be just inspired by something super mundane that I see. It's hard to, it's hard to really tell where creative creativity comes from. It's like, it's like you have this box that's like your brain, that's your creativity machine. And then things randomly will land in there and then you shake it up super hard and then what comes out is your idea <laughs> i don't know that's a great analogy where do you think creativity comes from like where where do those ideas and these thoughts like what is it i don't know i try to take an on materialistic approach because that just makes me feel a lot better about um being alive um i don't really know okay let me let me think about it a little bit more okay so i definitely do believe in the collective conscious so i do believe there are ideas um and even more powerful ideas that are floating around that might be like egregores or thought forms 
that could be floating around. And when you're in, um, I try and do a lot of my um, creative thinking first thing when I wake up, um, first thing in the morning. So I've got a cup of coffee in my sketchbook, first thing. So I feel like my mind is really open and receptive to some of these ideas that might just be floating around. Um, I think it's a combination of of that, um, maybe the collective consciousness and subconsciousness and, and then maybe even the science people are right too, that, you know, um, that we're just influenced by things we see and read about, you know, maybe they're right a little bit, but I also do believe in magic and that sort of un- non-tangible um, I'm not explaining it very well. It's a really hard thing to explain creativity. You know, it make I'm, I'm following you right along. Cause I, I can, I can align that, you know, you know, we have to wonder how it all works, how consciousness and how we're able to tap into certain things, how, you know, we think about some of the greats through antiquity, like they weren't as, they didn't have as much maybe in their face, proverbially, like they weren't being inundated with all these things, but yet they were able to create masterpieces and wonderful works of art that are so timeless and now iconic, you know, centuries later. So that's, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was, the, that brought up a really interesting idea for me when you were saying having stuff in their face. I actually noticed that um, the opposite for me, and I think probably if you were to ask most creators, um, when you aren't taking in stimulus, if you aren't taking in like movies and um, media and um, anything like that, when you aren't taking things in, stuff starts coming out of you. So you can't do both of these things at once. So if you have nothing going on, creativity will start coming out of you in a weird way. Like I don't, and first thing in the morning, I don't, I don't listen to music. I don't do anything. It's like just dull open space. And I feel like that is when that is one of for anybody who's wanting to feel creative or feeling like they're maybe having um, some sort of a block, you know, scaling away from taking in um, media or anything, Um, just going for walks, um, you know, living without taking in external stuff uh, is the, key to opening up that channel i feel like you know a lot of people will look for things for inspiration but um i don't really know if you need to look for inspiration because you probably already took it in somewhere and you just have to shake up that black box and like have something fall out (laughs) no no i love that i love the the sentiment of having already been inspired and it's in there. I like that. Yeah. It's fascinating what can still live within our subconscious, you know, long after, you know, we've been impacted by something, how it makes its way out. Mm -hmm. It's, and I feel like when I look at your artwork and now having had you know, scratching the surface with a conversation, you know, seeing, you know, what's coming out, you know, when you're putting that, you know, on your canvas and the artwork and like knowing, you know, all the inspiration and the ideas that you've had. And it's so fascinating and it gives even more depth to your already deep paintings, in my opinion. (laughs) Oh, thanks so much. I appreciate that. Yeah. Sincerely. It's just, there's so much to it. Um, and that's, that's why it resonates and because it's, it's felt, you know, it's not just seen and observed it's, it's sincerely felt. And I think that's what, there's something to be said about that energy. You know, when we talk about magic, we talk about, um, you know, that consciousness, um, there's something, something to be said, um, about it. And to your point, 
uh, some of the ways you've gone about the inspiration. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have a, yeah. Now that I think about it, I have a few other weird ideas and ways I come up with ideas too, that, um, that, uh, might not sound as normal or might not be like a normal way of doing things, but I'm able to get ideas by inventing like uh, imaginary characters in my head and then putting them like during a, during like a meditation, I'll give them a task to go and actually like search this imaginary world for ideas and for interesting things. So that's like another way of, way that I do it um yeah being yeah being an artist is a weird thing well I don't think it's weird (laughs) yeah I think it's I think I would be really weird and if I didn't do it right yeah and there's that's the I think that's the beauty of of art and it and I think that's why it is so concerning when I hear about, you know, whether it's, you know, art programs being the first to maybe get kind of those financial cuts, you know, whether it's in schools or just like programs and things like that, like it, it just, it pains me because it, art has created, well, it promotes some of the most creative thinkers in this world, problem solvers, and something we, in my opinion, need more and more of. Yeah, I agree. I think it, really enriched my life and um yeah really it's really important especially with with just the way that the world is going i think with um with just the rise of so much media there's so much media out there and it's you know it's what makes us human in a weird way um to be able to express ourselves versus yeah taking in um, just taking in media to be able to, to, to put something out there into the world. Um, yeah, I hadn't really thought about, um, I didn't go to art school necessarily. I took those two weeks in school, <laughs> like a community college later, but I was, I hadn't really thought about, you know, just the idea of, um, all these art programs getting cut across the country. I always, in high school and in junior high, I was always taking the art classes. Um, Usually they would just let us have free reign. I don't remember them being very structured, but they were some of the happiest classes in my life. And I really, really liked the other kids in those classes. And um, it was really good for me personally. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shame. The idea of those getting cut. Yeah, I think about a lot of the folks that, you know, growing up, you know, the same way, like I enjoyed art class and I felt, I felt more at ease with things, you know, being able to just kind of create and, you know, sure, there were some boundaries or some, I guess, some rules, so to speak, but for the most part, it felt like this is, this is your time to express. And uh, there's something to be said about being able to express yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if everybody feels this way, but I've always felt like that was my only, um, that was my purpose in life was to create stuff, you know, whether it be music or, um, you know, writing or painting. For me, uh, art and music, it's, it's helped me so much with just like my mental health and just being able to you know, I'll have full disclosure, you know, I have good days or bad days, but I feel like when I'm not being creative or if I'm not having an outlet for expression, um, I feel it, you know, there's something just internally that I just, I feel under some sort of weight and I'm not able to kind of shake that funk off. And so it's just like this, you know, this thing that I've just experienced my whole life. So. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. Especially when I was, um, when I was bartending, I almost, took up uh, painting again as like a form of therapy to um, to just feel right during the day and stuff. Um, 
yeah, like I didn't really know what I was going to do after college. And, um, and bartending was so not my normal personality. The only reason I got into bartending was because I was playing in punk bands. So I knew the bar owners in Eugene, Oregon. And, um, and I think I was right after college, I was working at a pizza shop and, um, you know, as like a punk would do. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, they, one day some people were like, we need you to come in and work this shift. And I was like, what? They're like, yeah, come to the bar and work this shift. I was like, fine. So, um, I bartending pulled me in. I didn't even do it, but, um, but then, um, during, during the day after a night of bartending, which was so chaotic and just loud and crazy, it was some chill time. And I really enjoyed, um, enjoyed painting. And I probably, I've stayed bartending for quite a long time, but, um, but I think painting weirdly kept me in bartending and bartending kept me painting. So they both really helped each other out and they kept me sane through bartending. And it's kind of a, a profession where it can, there are a lot of, um, uh, I don't know, you have to fight alcoholism and drug use and like all sorts of chaotic um negative things and I think painting really helped me to keep my head on straight during that whole that whole job thing right on that's a great point you know thinking about the pitfalls that could be accompanying bartending. yeah yeah I can see where one was your anchor for sure <laughs> yeah yeah definitely or maybe even a proverbial white uh like a like a lighthouse for you know your beacon of keeping you you know, keeping you on, on course. I said, I, yeah, I eventually I got sober, so I don't drink or do any drugs or anything. I've been like that for years now and I owe it all the painting. That's awesome. Oh, that's wonderful. That's again, another staple to the Testament of, of art music, or just being able to express oneself and have, have a vision and be able to execute it. Yeah. Love that. So do you have any events or anything that's coming up? I know you've slowed down. You don't really do galleries so much. Um, yeah, I don't work with galleries anymore. I used to work with, um, I was represented for five years uh, through Red Truck Gallery in New Orleans. And that was cool. Um, but I stopped working with galleries um, because it just made more sense for me to um to ship and work directly with collectors. I like knowing who the collectors are too. It's cool to form relationships with people. Um, so yeah, I guess I don't really do events. I mean, people can find me on, um, online. However, I, mean, I, I just said that I would actually really like to do some more tabling events, mm. um, where, um, I love those. Those are super fun where you just like sell your prints and merch, merchy type of things. I've, I used to do those in Portland and then the pandemic happened, but now that it's getting chill again um, and I live here in the Midwest, I think that would be really fun to do. So maybe I'll pop over to Chicago and do some tabling and stuff. Definitely reminds me of being in the band and like doing band stuff. It's really fun. Um, so maybe I'll do that again, but yeah, people can find me online on my website and um, on social media and all that. That's awesome. So what's the website that people can find you? It's um, Mark Rogers art. Um, and then my Instagram is also at Mark Rogers art. And yeah, those are the two easiest ways to find me. I love that. Any, any words that you would give any aspiring young artists, painters, or maybe someone who's not sure about taking that leap? Um, well, um, I would say that uh, having grit is probably one of the most important things, having uh, a lot of discipline and um, doing the work, whether or not you feel like doing the work, is very important. You just have to stay on a schedule and it's a 
total marathon. You just have to do the work every day and just keep doing it and keep repeating it um, and stay on a schedule and stuff. I feel that, um, that someone would know whether or not they have to do it or they're thinking about doing it. Um, if they're thinking about doing it, um, they might, that might not be enough. Like they would feel like they have to do it. You know, I have to have to do it. Mm. So it's that sort of a feeling that one would get. If you don't have to do it, I would maybe recommend not doing it because there are a lot of cool things out there in life. And I feel like I miss out on quite a lot of them by spending so much time in front of an easel, like making up weird characters in my imagination and stuff. You know, I could be like having friends. I could be um, working at a job that pays me more. I could, you know, do a lot of things, but, um, but I have to do this. So. I love that so much when you feel that need and you have to do it Mm -hmm. and you're following that path. Yeah, definitely. Oh, Mark. I love that. Um, any recommendations, uh, favorite coffees or tea? (laughs) Favorite coffee is, uh, I just drink black coffee. I'm not very picky. I drink some, any breakfast blend. Nice. Um, Tea. Oh, again, I'm kind of boring. I drink a shitload of tea, though. I drink a lot of chamomile. Mm. I drink a lot of coffee and a lot of tea, but I don't have any. Um, I have very low brow taste as far as this goes. <laughs> <It's> like, <it's, laughs> I don't drink Folgers though anymore. Oh, no more Folgers. Yeah, I only did that when I was very young and broke and punk. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, because that's what you do. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Three chords, the truth, and some Folgers. Uh, yeah, some <laughs> Folgers. <laughs> yeah, <I> just, <laughs> amazing. That's awesome. Oh, and some. Uh, do you have any like recommendations for like maybe some books or some other artists that have inspired you? Um, other artists. Well, I always go back to the old masters. I mean, I like Albert Durer. <sighs> Um, he's one of my heroes. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, uh, Bruegel, um, um, I really like James Gurney. People might not have heard of him, although he is pretty famous. Um, he is, um, he illustrated these books called Dinotopia. Um, they're more geared towards children, but he has sort of, um, His illustration style is more like golden age of illustration, more like 60s, um, 70s, almost like a Norman Rockwell style, even though Norman Rockwell was a little bit before that. But um, but yeah, James Gurney uh, has a website and a blog where he has a lot of resources for artists and art education and stuff like that. And I would say he was weirdly one of my art teachers, but I just, I never met him. I just read his blog and read everything that he had to say. Um, I love a lot of the fantasy artists. Um, um, I'm looking over at my (laughs) bookshelf over there. I was like, who do I have? Oh yeah. Like Boris Vallejo. I love, um, um, you know, Remedio Savaro, she's one of my favorites. Yeah, as far as books go, I read a lot of fantasy books. So nice. I read a lot of fantasy series. I'm not really, I don't have highbrow book taste at all. <laughs> I read straight up swords and sorcery fantasy. Nice. And if you're going to listen to music, what do you, what do you tend to gravitate towards these days? Well, I listen to a lot of classical guitar music. So I'm learning classical guitar, but I love doom metal, death metal, stoner metal. Um, and I think that's it. I like some black metal. Um, I will listen to mainly metal and then classical guitar. Those are my two genres. Although I do like um, to listen to... Um, 
mariachi music sometimes when I'm cooking. Ooh, it makes nice. me feel good. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's pretty much that's pretty much what I really like. Oh, I also like Dungeon Synth. That, that's kind of a new one. Ooh. Yeah, Dungeon Synth. Have you heard of that? No, this is a first. Yeah, Dungeon Synth is pretty cool. Old Sorcery is my favorite Dungeon Synth band. It's just magical music. Like if you were going to probably be playing D&D with your friends or something, you would have maybe some Dungeon Synth in the background. Sometimes, actually, when I paint, I'll listen to some weird music, too. I have a hard time listening to uh, metal when I'm painting, um, especially like technical thrash metal or anything like that, because I'll just get sort of into the music and I'll get and if you get distracted. But, um, mm. but sometimes I'll listen to um, like this Dungeon Synth stuff or I'll listen to video game soundtracks, which is bizarre, but... Um, they're for like, I don't have time to play video games. I wish I did because I think they're cool, but um, I don't. But listening to the soundtracks are kind of cool for painting um, because I think they're, you know, you're supposed to be playing for a pretty long time. So they help you get into a flow state where you're playing these games. And it actually works pretty well when you're painting as well. So, so yeah, so I like to listen to the technical um death metal and stuff like that when grocery shopping or something like that where i'm out in public mm. that feels best that feels <laughs> best for me <laughs> right right going down the but bread yeah. aisle just you know <laughs> yeah you're going down the bread aisle you're listening to some gate creeper or like um who else have i been listening to there's this band called carnation that's pretty mm. pretty brutal i forget where they're from sweden or norway one of those places um yeah, I like a lot of, I like Exhumed. Um, yes. I like High on Fire, of course. Nice. Um, yeah, Yob. Um, yeah, just some of the bands that I, that are kind of from Portland. Ooh, Lord Dying, I love them. Oh, yeah. I love Lord Dying. Um, yeah. Nice. I could, I could start naming a lot. I could get go down... Go down the metal hole. Awesome. Right on. Well, we're just going to have to have a part two to the podcast. Just okay, exclusively cool. metal bands. Just metal. Okay, sweet. <laughs> sounds fun. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh, Mark, I cannot thank you enough for, for doing this. Just sharing your time, your energy, and your space with us, man. Thanks, Jay. This was so cool. Thanks for having me on here. What a fun talk. And there you have it. I cannot thank you enough for all your time, your energy, and your fantastic artwork, Mark. This has been an absolute pleasure of a conversation, and I look forward to our next one. You can find Mark at markrogersart.com and on Instagram at markrogersart. If you're listening to the podcast, please take a moment and rate it. We're still a new podcast, so by you rating it helps us reach more listeners. You can find us on Instagram at itd.jcosta, as well as on Twitter at itd underscore jcosta. And if you're part of our growing community on Facebook, you can absolutely find In the Deep with Jay Costa on Facebook as well. This has been such an amazing journey, and I just love meeting new folks and sharing their stories with each and every one of you. Thank you all so much. Until next time, take care of one another and keep thinking for yourself.